So in our previous class, we have already discussed about the Maxwell model and Calvin uh, Kelvin Bozik model. So uh, basically, in that model, what happens? You are using a dashboard and a spring, or a spring uh, or dashboard in a series connection or in a parallel connection. And based on this, stress and strains should be calculated or prepared. So basically, that two models are Maxwell model and Kelvin model. So based on this Maxwell model and Kelvin model, as uh, they are compressed of only two components, that models are called two component model. Now, uh, in this in this same type of model, uh, that is model using the spring and dashboard, if you use three components, like uh, two springs and one dashboard, or two dashboard, one spring, like that, in such cases, this type of models are called three component models. Okay, three component models. Now here details mathematical formulation for the three component model is given. So basically that thing uh, is not needed for you. I just uh, write it uh, for the references only. Okay, for the three component model, see this is a three component model where here one uh, spring and one dashboard is connected by parallel connection and these both things, basically this particular portion, basically, in this model, this particular portion is nothing but your Kelvin Bojit model, and that Kelvin Bojit model is connected with a spring in the series connection. Okay, so uh, if you go for the details analysis, so you know uh, what is the stress and strain somewhere there, and after that, you just have to consider that stress in that spring in this model. Okay, so basically, these are the three component model. Now, after that, one generalized model is there. So, if you increase the number of component, then three component model, four component model. Now, if you increase the component of the model in n numbers, in that case, that type of models are called generalized model. Okay. Now, this expression is uh, uh, basically in generalized models are a large infinite number of components are used. Okay, so instead of two or three components, there are n numbers of components which are used over there. Now, this is an example of generalized Maxwell model. Okay, this is an example of generalized Max Maxwell model. See here, all these components are connected in series and after that, all these Maxwell models are connected in parallel connection. So see, this, this is one Maxwell model, this is another Maxwell model, this is another Maxwell model, and all these Maxwell models are connected in a parallel connection. Okay, so this is a generalized Maxwell model. model. Similarly, you can design for a generalized Kelvin model, Kelvin logic model like that. So when n numbers of components are used, in that case, that type of models are called generalized model. And uh, this is your generalized Kelvin Bojit model. See here, all these, uh, these are the your Kelvin model where one dashboard and one spring is connected in a parallel connection. And all these Kelvin models are connected with series connection with each other. Okay, and there are n numbers of Kelvin models. So this is basically a generalized Kelvin model. Okay, so basically these are for your basic understanding that what are the different types of models and how these models are formed. These mathematical expressions are not needed for you. You just have to uh, uh, read about that Kelvin and Maxwell, Maxwell model that is only integrated in your syllabus. Okay, so these are the different type of models and how these models are formed. Okay, this is all about the different types of models and how these different models are formed. Now, uh, let us go for the uh, next uh, thing. Now, uh, the thing is, 
linear visco elasticity so what does this mean by linear visco elasticity so a rheologic material can be called linear visco elastic if the following two conditions are satisfied a rheologic uh, material rheologic material means that material which uh, for which the uh, characteristic changes with the temperatures this type of materials can be called linear viscoelastic linear viscoelastic means their viscoelastic nature is linear in characteristic okay so they could be called linear viscoelastic if these two conditions are satisfied first one is homogeneity so for a stress controlled experiment stress controlled experiment means where stress would be constant that would be stress controlled experiment so in the stress controlled uh, experiment basically that represents the fifth condition so for a stress controlled experiment double the strain is observed at a particular time if double the original stress has been applied now for a stress control experiment double the strain is observed at a particular time if double the original stress has been applied so basically what happens in a stress control experiment where you can control the uh, stress stress parameter in such cases if you observe a double quantity of the strain okay whatever strain should be there a double quantity of strain you are, if you are observing for the stresses which would be double of the original stress so that is homogeneity similarly for a strain control experiment if that is a strain control experiment double the stress is observed at a particular time if the double the original stress uh, uh, strain has been applied so basically this is the homogeneity in such cases so in such case homogeneity is suppose there is some stress and strain control experiment so for a stress control experiment if you uh, observe a double strain double strain means whatever strain value is there that is double of the normal strain value okay double the strain values when you are observed at a particular time and if that double the strain value are observed when the stresses are doubled okay and for a strain controlled experiment if you are observing double the stress whenever your strain is doubled that is called your homogeneity in such case the next point is superposition so what is superposition the response at a given time to a number of individual excitations applied at different times is the sum of the responses that would have occurred by each excitation acting alone at this respective timings so superposition means the response at a given time now uh, for whether that is a stress control or a stress a strain control whenever if you are applying stresses or you are applying strains in that case you will get some responses now these responses in a terms of stress or strain at a given time to a number of individual excitations applied at different different times now these responses would be different at different time intervals based on the input parameters or uh, and this input parameters or this total response is the sum of the responses or sum of the outcomes that would have occurred by each excitation acting alone at this respective respective times so suppose uh, in that case what happens suppose for a stress control or strength, uh, strain control experiments you are getting different responses for stress and strain behavior okay and this stress and strain behavior at different time intervals are this now if you add up or uh, now if you go for a individual responses at each each and particular time in that case that, that responses for particular time would be suppose like that for each and individual time and as a total you are getting a something response of like suppose 20 uh, newton per mm square for stresses 
Now, if you add up all these individual parameters in that case, that would be equal to 20 Newton per mm square for a system which is superposition. So that is basically the meaning of the superposition in such case. Now uh, let us discuss what is time temperature superposition. Okay, so in this case, the superposition concept would be more clear to you. Just a minute. So the response of an asphaltic material shows the dependency on time as well as on the temperature. So basically that means the nature or characteristics of the asphaltic material changes along with the time and the temperature on which that material is over there. Now for example, the variation of creep compliance at different times at two temperatures, suppose T and T double dash, where T temperature T is greater than T double dash has been plotted schematically in figure 2.16. Okay, so this is the creep compliance of two different asphaltic material at different time intervals are showing over there. Okay. So one is for the T dash, then another one is T double dash, where T dash the uh, temperature is greater than T double dash. Now what was the uh, compliance in a creep condition? That is the stress divided by strain is the creep compliance. Now it can be seen that at a given temperature, suppose T dash, the creep at time T is lower than that of the time T double dash. Now if you uh, consider, if you can consider this both this time, now see at a particular time T dash, so this is your creep, creep, uh, creep uh, compliance and at T double dash, this is your creep compliance okay now if you uh, find out the time or if you find out the creep in that case you can see that the creep at time t is lower than that of time t double dash okay so that is obvious that the creep of the, at time t is lower than the creep at time t double dash for a particular t double dash or t dash whichever you are considering over there. Now, why is this changes? Because as the time increases, the strain keeps on increasing. Okay, as the time increases, the strain uh, keeps on increasing. Further, it can be seen that at given time, say at T dash, the creep at temperature T dash is lower than that of the temperature T dash. This is because if the temperature is higher, the strain will be more at the, at the same given time. So basically, if you consider these two creep compliances, like creep compliance means the strain, stress divided by strain in a creep condition. Okay, in a creep condition, that is the stress divided by strain is your 
keep compliance. Now here it is representing the creep and here it is the time in logarithmic scale that is ln t. Now in this case, if t dash and t double dash represent the creep behavior at two different temperatures, t dash and t double dash, where your t dash temperature is greater than t double dash, in that case you can observe some parameters at a given temperature. Suppose t dash, you can observe a creep value of okay, a creep value of suppose c dash creep. Okay, at T double test temperature, you will observe a creep value of suppose for that C double test creep. Now, the thing is here the creep value at T double test is higher that is C double test creep because as the temperature changes, as the temperature changes, in that case, strain on these two asphaltic material would be imposing at a higher rate. Therefore, you are great, uh, getting a greater creep value at the at the time changes. Okay, or at the temperature at the time changes. So basically, this is the your uh, time temperature superposition. Now this behavior speaks for an equivalency that may exist between time and temperature. For example. The creep measure at time t at temperature t double dash is equal to c creep. So, uh, for example, this uh, creep c creep that is the c creep measured at time t double dash. So, basically, that are the t, t dash and t double dash. These are the two time measured at t double dash at temperature t dash. So, basically, these are the graph for. for your temperature and this is the time so t double dash and this this portion particular portion so basically that represents the creep of a particular asphaltic material which is measured at which is Uh, sorry for the interruption. So, which is uh, measured at your time uh, t dash and t double dash with the temperature t dash and t double dash. So, in that case, you can see that what are the creep value at time at time t dash and temperature t dash and at time t double dash and temperature t double dash. Okay. Now, you can observe that at the same time. Okay, at the same time, t dash, you are getting the two creep values for different temperature. Okay, so one you creep value for the different temperature for this, uh, and you are getting like c creep value as and c dash creep values. So, which are represented by these two points. Okay. So basically, at the same time, you are getting two creep values for the two temperature. Okay. Now, similarly, if you draw one particular uh, particular line, And if you draw this, in that case, you can say that at that particular uh, two different times, your creep value would be similar. Okay, at these two particular different times, your creep value would be similar, but the time is different. So basically, that creep compliance value not only changes with the time, that also changes with the temperature. So basically, temperature and time both plays an important role in that creep behavior of an asphaltic material. Okay, so for this reason, it is called time temperature superposition. 
Why superposition? Because this time and temperature both are superimposed on that material characteristic, which will enable the material to behave in different uh, way in different time and different temperature. So for this reason, it is called time temperature superposition. So in this reason, for this reason, a relationship between the two time scales can be proposed as your T dash equal to T double dash divided by alpha T. So if you uh, learn, uh, log, take log log or learn in this case, in that case it will be ln T dash equal to ln T da double dash minus ln alpha T, where T dash can be called the the reduced time of T double dash for shifting the test temperature from T dash to T double dash and alpha T is called the time temperature shift factor. Okay, so in this case, alpha T is called time temperature shift factor and T dash can be called the reduced time for T double dash. So basically, here T double dash is the higher time and T dash is the lower time. So you can say that uh, initial time is T dash and final time is T double dash and within this T dash to T double dash time interval, the temperature is going from T double dash to T dash. Okay, so basically for the shifting of the temperature, total time taken is T dash to T double dash and alpha T basically represents that, uh, that shifting of the temperature or test temperature and it is called the time temperature shift factor. So obviously alpha t is a function of these two temperature that is it is function of the t dash and t double dash capital T dash and t double dash. So one of them can be treated as a standard temperature. So material for which alpha t value is not a dependent of time can be called thermobiologically simple material. So for the material for which alpha t value is dependent on time that type of materials are called radiological model and which for which the model for which the alpha t is not dependent on time that type of model could be called thermo radiologically simple material Now, next uh, portion is fatigue test on bituminous mixes. So, how fatigue test has been done on the bituminous mix. Now, what is fatigue? Fatigue is a phenomenon of fracture under repetitive cyclic or fluctuating load. So, basically fatigue indicates all the different types of repetitive load which causes tensile fractures over the top of the surface okay over the top of the surface that type of uh, failure of the pavement is called fatigue failure so in that case you can see that suppose a pavement structure is there in that case suppose that is a vehicle tire and that would be uh, uh, constantly in contact with the road surface suppose that vehicle tire is rotating in a particular direction so after each and every repetitive load, what will happen in the uh, below portion there would be some tensile forces which would be acting like that. So because of the tensile forces, this top surface of the pavements uh, have to be or a top uh, surface of the pavements are seen to have formed different crack or fail. Okay, so this failure of the top surface of the pavement because of that repetitive tensile loading conditions are called fatigue failure. 
Now the fatigue life of a bituminous mix is defined as the number of repetition for which the initial stress or strain changes by an arbitrary factor. Now the fatigue life is that it indicates that after that how many rotations of a cyclic load can be taken care by a particular pavement. So that indicates by suppose there are 10,000 uh, rotation 20, and or 20,000 rotation after that whatever stress parameter or initial stress or strain of the body was there that will change considerably. Okay, so basically that is your fatigue life. That is how many rotations of that cyclic load are required to change for the initial stress or strain in a particular body by an arbitrary factor, by a considerable number. So basically that is your fatigue life. So basically that is a fatigue testing uh, of a bituminous material, schematic diagram of a fatigue testing of a bituminous material where loads are applied. Okay, so and this is the depth of that uh, particular specimen and L is the length of the particular specimen. So loads are applied at a distance of L by 3 in this different position. So these and these are the reaction or support conditions of that particular material which you are testing. Now these supports are placed in both the direction because the cyclic loading pushes the beam for the duration of half cycle and then pulls it from the rest half. So see here, supports are placed both at the top and both at the bottom portions of that uh, uh, portion because whenever you are uh, providing a cyclic loading condition, now by the nature of the cyclic uh, loading condition, for half of the time of that uh, particular revolution, it will push the sample in the downward direction and for the other uh, uh, remaining time, it will pull the sample in the upward direction. Therefore, you need to provide the support condition both at the top and bottom so that the particular uh, sample remain in its position. So here, uh, figure below also shows two repetitive loads separated by one third of the length of the beam L. So one repetitive load is P and another repetitive load is P which are acting at a distance of L by 3 of in that sample. Now why two loads are used? Two loads are generally used because the bending moment in the middle part of the beam is constant and the shear force is zero. Therefore the failure of the beam takes place on account of the pure flexural fatigue. So, uh, because two loads are taken because the bending moment in the middle third. So, this is the mid middle third corresponding uh, to uh, this portion and this is the middle third corresponding to this stage. Now, this bending moment generally at the middle third of the beam is constant. So, bending moment at the middle third is constant and the shear force if the bending moment is constant in that case shear force would be zero. Okay, so therefore failure of the beam takes place on account of the pure flexural fatigue. So there will be nothing only because of the flexural fatigue only the beam will be failed. So when the beam will be failed, there will not be other consideration like your shear force and bending mode. The beam is failed only because of the pure flexural fatigue. So in this way, you can directly get to the idea of the total fatigue life of the pavement. Now fatigue tests are generally conducted under two types of control loading namely control stress amplitude and control strain amplitude. So basically one condition is your creep condition and another condition is your relaxation condition. 
So it is sometimes difficult, especially in the control string test, to establish the precise number of repetition required for the failure of the bin. So in the controlled uh, string test, okay, sometimes uh, that uh, that uh, researcher are feel that sometimes that that establishing the precise number of repetitions required for the failure is very much difficult in the strain control test. So as a consequence, arbitrary definition of the failure condition of a specimens are adopted. So basically in such cases in a strain condition, what happens you will not understand when the particular material fail. Okay, because that to understand whether it is failed or not, that uh, that is very much difficult in a strain condition. Therefore, you need to adopt some uh, failure mechanism so that you can check the total number of repetition in a strain control test. Okay, so as a consequence, the arbitrary definition of the failure condition of a specimen are adopted. For example, 50% reduction in the initial stress may be defined as the failure of the beam in constant strain testing. So in a constant strain testing, what happens? You are constantly straining a particular object. Now whenever the stress over there is reduced to half of the initial stress, in that case you will consider that the particular specimen is failed. Now at that time, whatever number of repetitions are there, that repetition is your total fatigue life or total repetition required for the failure of the pavement. So control stress fatigue testing is applicable to thick bituminous layer pavement while controlled strain fatigue testing is recommended for the thin bituminous pavement.
Okay, you can uh, leave the class. I have already taken the attendance.